Okay, big, bold title of today's podcast. The first thing I think you should know about fitness training that I believe everybody gets wrong. It's a fairly simple concept. Let's get stuck into it. This is going to be a podcast about the ideas of load, stress, and strain. Three words which I'm pretty sure you have heard. If you're anything to do with engineering or physics, this is pretty established terminology. Yet in fitness training, it kind of gets a bit muddled, a bit confused, a little bit of crosstalk between the two. We say that one thing, mean the other, and it's just got a little bit too confusing. Today, I want to set that straight and also make sure you understand why it's important to you making really good decisions about your fitness training. Right, let's get stuck into this. I also promise we are going to address training peaks, uh, training stress score, exert strain score, all that sort of thing, and put all that into context in this podcast. Here we go. Now, load is something that we should be fairly familiar with. In weightlifting terms, it's probably easiest to describe it because we can say something like, I'm going to lift 75 kilos for three repetitions. In cycling terms, we might say something like, I'm going to ride at 200 watts for 45 minutes. Now, this is really important because as a coach or even as a piece of training software, we need to prescribe to an athlete, to a rider, what it is we want them to do. Uh, your workout will be prescribed to you in a load score. And then as you complete that workout, we need to see whether that workout was completed as prescribed or whether it was under or over. So we have these very distinct measurements of what's being prescribed in your training and what's actually being achieved. And this is just describing the load. Now, on top of this, we need to add another element of measure. And that is the capacity to really understand whether what we are prescribing as a coach is going to be enough for the desired outcome we need to know what capacity is. Now, in cycling, there's lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, just very quickly in strength training, because it's so easy to conceptualize, we might do something like a one rep max. So what is the maximum amount of weight that you can lift in say a deadlift or a squat or something? In cycling, because it's such a dynamic sport, we have lots of different tests. The one that you're probably all familiar with is the FTP test, that 20 minutes, uh, transferred out to an hour um, measure of your threshold power. We also have things like the critical power test. This could be three minutes, 60 minute, whatever it is. It's just a test of your power output over a certain duration. Have the VO2 max test. We have lactate tests. We have muscle oxygen tests. We have lots of different ways of testing your body for DP. For instance, if you're a Sufferfest fan. So once we have capacity, we can now talk about what we know as stress. So to get a stress score, we need to know the load versus capacity. And we can now say things like, I want you to lift 75% of your one rep max. Or in cycling terms, a coach might describe it as, I want you to ride 70% of your FTP for 45 minutes, for instance. Now, with this in mind, we can now uh, elaborate that and build it onto metrics that you're probably a little bit more familiar with. Before I do that, the reason why this is important is because when we do these activities, we recognize that if you want to get fitter, just lifting your one rep max doesn't necessarily do it. So for instance, if you've got a 100 kilo deadlift, but um, just doing that every day is not going to necessarily get you any fitter. However, if you lift 75 kilograms five times, take a rest, repeat that five more times, your total tonnage, the amount of weight that you've lifted, um, is significantly more and therefore you get the greater fitness gains. In cycling terms, we wouldn't just prescribe you to ride at your FTP every day. You know, that's not a great way of getting fitter. We would prescribe you to ride slightly under your FTP, slightly over your FTP, to generate those fitness gains. So we build up the idea of both volume and intensity. We also need to make sure that you recover from this stress. So which leads us on to this idea of the training stress score, the exert strain score and tonnage. Now, if you're a training peaks user or you use any sort of, sort of fitness tracking apps, you're probably familiar with this idea that we take 
the load that you've either been prescribed or that you've achieved and given it a score. Now, the easiest one I think most people are familiar with in cycling terms is training stress score. And that simply says, if you ride at your measured FTP, i.e. your capacity for exactly one hour, you will score exactly 100 points. And you can apply some fairly simple mathematics to that to then go, well, if I rode 50% of my FTP for two hours, I'd score the same. You get the idea. Excert, uh, a piece of software that I'm really, really like using, and we use it a lot here at Mapdeck Cycleworks, is very, very similar, but they call it a strain score. The reason they do that is because some of their algorithms are a little bit more advanced and you can accumulate points differently depending on the duration and the intensity as well. More on that later. In weightlifting terms, we just talked about this. We have the concept of tonnage, which is the amount of weight that you lifted times the amount of reps that you achieved. And you build up this picture of, of tonnage. So by now you've got the idea, I think, that stress is that measure of load and your capacity. That is the important thing. How we measure that capacity can be very different depending on what it is that we're trying to achieve. Okay. Once we have stress in, where does strain come in? Because to get strain, we need some kind of deformation. We need to have observed some kind of a, of a change. Something has had to happen. Now, in engineering terms, this is perhaps easier to think about because if you were to place a load on a, a metal bar, for instance, and nothing happened, you could say that metal bar was under stress. Once you see a physical change, let's say that metal bar has bent a little bit, that is the point where we've seen it deform, there's been a deformation, and we can describe it that a strain has occurred. This is just the same in fitness training, and you can now start to see where things are starting to get muddled, because a strain now gives us the ability to say things like, um, I want you to lift 75% of your one rep maps, five sets for five reps. This ideally should have got to the point where a strain should be evident perhaps. Uh, in cycling terms, we would do something like ride 70% of your FTP for three hours. So we've now got some idea of not just the load and the capacity, but some sort of duration as well. Now, what we're trying to do in fitness training is get your body to just flirt with this idea because if we observe a deformation in our bodies, then something has, has happened that's going to trigger an adaptation. You can imagine that if you were an engineer and you saw that metal bar bend, then you might want to de design some kind of reinforcement to make it stronger. Our body works very, very similar. So if we overreach slightly we put our body under some strain then we will trigger an adaptation in our body to become fitter and stronger so that your body adapts to that strain now we can do that by either improving our capacity um, in two ways one we can either become stronger through the anabolic process that we've talked about in previous um, podcasts or we can do it through producing more energy in a more catabolic process. Either way, we need to have triggered some kind of an adaptation. However, uh, this can be wrong. <laughs> and this is where this podcast, I think, really, really gets interesting because of these three things. The capacity diminishes as duration continues. Now, the other thing is capacity diminishes as stress accumulates and capacity improves with training. So you can see that our capacity is constantly changing on a day-to-day -day basis, on, a, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Let me show you what I mean with one very, very simple concept that I think all cyclists will get. Let's take a, the world's simplest workout. Okay, let's just say that we are going to ride at 50% of your FTP, 100 watts, 200 watts, whatever it is. Let's say you're on an ergo turbo trainer and you can just hold a steady, consistent power 
for hours and hours and hours. So the actual load does not change. It is, it is the same. However, if I asked you to do that for an hour, you'd be like, yeah, no worries. This is, this is okay. Two hours, three hours, four hours, you get the idea. And what will happen is that we can measure this with our heart rate as well. So this is where the concept of heart rate decoupling comes in. And you can imagine that if you are doing a ride like this, first of all, this graph isn't exactly accurate. What will probably happen is that as you start doing exercise, your heart rate will come up, your body will start to warm up. Eventually your heart rate will come down again. It will stabilize and it will stay stable for quite a long time. But then as the duration continues, your heart rate will start to creep up and up and up and up and up. And this is because you're starting to fatigue. Therefore, your capacity has changed. And this is where the concept of training stress scores somewhat fall down because we have to imagine that the human body is not a metal bar. You know, we are very dynamic beings and our capacity will always change. And there's a lot, a lot of reasons for that. Now, the, we've talked about this before and actually a lot of the things that we've talked about are very similar to the signs and symptoms of fatigue. So let's say things like the amount of sleep that you get is going to massively change your capacity. What you've eaten the day before, the day before, during your workout, even after your workout. Just general life stress. Remember that stress is stress. With that bucket of stress that we have, it's, you know, life stress, psychological stress is just the same as physiological stress. Your body needs energy to process it. The time of day that you train might be a, a, a factor as well. What about your mood or even your hormone cycle is going to change it? Whether you're being cheered on and celebrated as you do your workout or whether it's caught you in the middle of an argument or something like that, that's going to diminish your capacity. Just the general fatigue. Are you actually recovered from the workout that you did the day before or the race or whatever it is? If you're tired, there is no way that you can achieve your FTP score. Illness, even just a very, very minor sniffle or something or an allergy such as hay fever is going to change your capacity. Uh, heat, <laughs> we're in a heat wave at the moment, dehydration, all of those things, core body temperature, they're all going to diminish your capacity. So in that case, if we can't really measure capacity, would you say that a training stress score isn't really a measure of training stress? Is it just a slightly more elaborate load score? And that's kind of what I would argue is that if we don't always know what our capacity is, then we don't really know what we're measuring that load against. And because it is so variable, we just need to be hyper aware of it because as much as we want to get our body to the point where it's slightly overreaching, we have to recognize that that point is changing all the time. The chances are that if you did your FTP test when you were absolutely in your prime that the following day that capacity would be diminished there's no way you can achieve that again the following day the same way is if you are racing back to back to back you're not going to uh, win your race on the fourth day of racing back to back you know unless you've had a period of rest and recovery in there as well okay so with that in mind what should you do now <laughs> you know you can go on accumulating tss absolutely it's still a very very good measure but i think what we should do is approach it with a little bit more intelligence than just accumulating a score because we still need to flirt with strain if we want to improve and i say that because if you take your load scores, your TSS scores as verbatim, and you ride to them, then there's a very real danger of one, overreaching and taking longer to recover. Or two, if your capacity is actually improved because you got fitter, then you're not necessarily flirting with that strain score, triggering an adaptation. Remember, what we're looking for in a workout is the minimum effective dose to trigger an adaptation. So we want to be able to recover from our workout 
in like 24 hours time so that we can then go and repeat the process and get that nice steady progressive build without the risk of over overtraining. Two, I think you need to judge your capacity constantly, not just that day, but that hour, that minute. You know, how do you feel? The rate of perceived exertion, your RPE score, is still of critical importance you know, to how, how we judge things. And if you are feeling hot, if you are feeling dehydrated, if you are feeling tired, recognize that right into your numbers, your FTP score, your percentage of your FTP, it's going to be different. And it's okay, accept that, because the intelligent athlete knows that so long as you have done enough to trigger an adaptation, that's all you need to do because performance happens in the recovery. The performance does not happen from training harder and harder and harder. The performance gains come from doing enough to trigger your body, to put it under some strain and then allowing the recovery process, that anabolic process to um, reinforce your body, if you like, to make it stronger, to make it more efficient and meet that strain, meet that demand. Okay. And the third thing is, is with all that in mind, go out, do your workout, do your ride, do your race, and make really good decisions after your warm up. Once you've done a really good warm up, and maybe a warm up that you do the same one every single time, you should have a pretty good measure of what your body is feeling. You know, whether you're feeling tired, fatigued, whether you're feeling on it or not, and just check in with yourself like, how am I feeling? right now you know and combine that with all that data that you have all those training stress scores all that sort of stuff and go yes now i've warmed up is my capacity what i think it is is it better is it worse and then go out to do that workout that ride that race you get the idea i think okay i think i've labored on uh for quite some time now um and this is really about giving you some ideas about questioning that TSS score, questioning that load score, questioning your own capacity, knowing that the workout in front of you is a load score based on a capacity that was the best knowledge at that time. It could definitely, well, it has definitely changed since that was written. And it's up to you as an athlete to make those really good decisions. Don't be greedy as an athlete. It's so, so tempting, especially if you're on peak form, like many of you are right now in the summer, to be greedy. Remember, you just need the minimum effective dose to trigger an adaptation. Performance games happen in the recovery phase, not in the training phase. And it takes significantly longer to recover from an injury and overtraining than it does to improve your fitness just by a small amount each day. Okay, thanks for watching in. Please add your comments below. If you want to learn more, please hit that subscribe button and watch out for the next episode. Till the next time, take it easy.